come from the Solomon's Pillars at the Timna Park, where we have a beautiful rock formation over here behind me, a result of the erosion by the uh, water, the rain, and the wind. And we can see that the color of most of the rocks and even the soil in this area is very rich, is very different, it's very dark, kind of pinkish. And that, of course, takes us to the um, reason for it, which is the copper concentration here in this soil. And it's interesting because the Bible said that the Lord is going to bring the children of Israel into a very, very unique land. Small land, size of New Jersey, but very, very, very diverse and very uh, rich with so many minerals and so many things. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, Therefore, you shall keep the commandments in verse 6 of the Lord your God to walk in His ways and to fear Him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. Pay attention, it's not olives, it's olive oil. People never ate olives in those days. It is the olive oil that they use the olives for. But then he says, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing. And then it goes on, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. So the Bible tells us that the Lord is going to bring the people of Israel into a land that is rich with so many things, including iron and copper. And that is exactly where we are. We found ancient Egyptian copper mines in this whole area. We call it Solomon Copper Mines because we know that Solomon, throughout his kingdom, expanded the territory all the way, the Bible says, to Etzion Gever, which is a lot of today. And therefore, the kingdom of Solomon made it to the Red Sea. And that allowed, of course, the Queen of Sheba to come all the way from the Red Sea into the land, into the kingdom of Solomon, to behold that amazing temple that he built that was one of the wonders of the world of those days. So we shouldn't be surprised to see this beauty. We shouldn't be surprised to see the riches of the soil and the rocks and water and, and fruits and, and barley and wheat and of course honey. Some suggest that the honey for the most part was date honey in those days. We've traveled around this area. We've seen thousands of date palms and obviously um, the uh, dates were used not only to be eaten, but also to, uh, the product, for the production of the date honey itself. In fact, uh, right by the Dead Sea, we found the area of Qumran, a paved platform with 100,000 date pits. We believe that was a factory for that which we call it today Silan, the date honey or the date syrup. So here we are in the middle of the desert, believe it or not, but this is part of the route that the children of Israel took during the 40 years of the wandering in the desert. Which brings us, obviously, to the point of the Exodus and the wandering in the desert. We're going to be in the Red Sea and we're going to see the actual area between Egypt and Saudi Arabia where I believe the crossing of the Red Sea took place. And definitely we're going to talk about the story of the Exodus and the crossing of the Red Sea. But once they crossed the Red Sea, we see something very interesting that happened. First of all, many scholars believe that there's no way the children of Israel covered that much of a distance um, in such a short time. But these scholars take away from God that which only God can do. The Bible says in Exodus 19 verse four, I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Eagle's wings, as far as I know, is not walking, it's flying. <laughs> and as far as I'm concerned, time was not really something that we could measure the same way we do today with walking and wandering in, 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 in between Egypt itself and the Red Sea. Something magnificent happened there. Something unbelievable happened there. Something so miraculous happened there. And the children of Israel 
covered a long distance in such a short time because God bore them on eagle's wings. So here they are. They, brought, they were brought out of Egypt on eagle's wings and they were given manna in the desert. The Lord brought water out of the rocks. The, the, the Lord provided everything. That you're hungry, I'll give you manna, everything. But it's interesting because sometimes we can forget the goodness of the Lord when we actually have everything. We must remember that in the desert, as you can look around, it's really all about you and God. There's not much there beside that. There's no tap water here. There's no McDonald here. <laughs> there is no, um, uh, there, there really is nothing. You really have to rely on God. And if there is one thing that God loves about the desert, if there's one thing that God wants us to remember is the time that he had with us in the desert. In fact, in the book of Jeremiah chapter two, we can clearly see how the Lord is describing that which happened between him and the people of Israel in the desert. And he said to them over there, again in Jeremiah chapter two, I remember you in verse two, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal, when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land not sown, Israel was my holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him will offend. Disaster will come upon them, says the Lord. Amen. It's interesting how God is so zealous when it comes to the people of Israel. He says anyone who is going to touch them, to do anything, will have to pay for it because these are my people. But the one thing that God remembered the most as far as the relationship between Israel and himself is the time when they were walking in the land unsown. I remember the days, the first days of my marriage when literally we had nothing. We had no money. We lived in a tiny little shoe box and it was amazing. It was amazing because there was not much to expect to. We really every day relied on God for something. God wants us to rely on Him. God wants us to look at Him. God wants to meet us. God wants to spend time with us. By the way, right here in the desert, you really, really don't have much time to spend with anyone else but with the Lord. This is why Jesus was in the desert. This is why David was in the desert. This is why the entire monastic movement of monasteries and monks started in the desert when people were seeking that time and that place to be alone with the Lord. And the Lord remembers those days of walking in the land unsown, of walking in, a, and he calls it the love of your betrothal. We're talking about almost like a relationship that just started. It's not even the marriage yet. And you can clearly see how the wedding and how the excitement and how those things are playing a great importance in that which God chooses to remember with the history of Israel and, and chooses to obviously turn his way or turn his, his face from the other things. Now, we must remember that Moses came all the way with the children of Israel, all the way below Mount Sinai. It was in the desert just like this. You can clearly see right now something like that and imagine to yourself that Mount Sinai was probably, I don't know, a hundred times higher than this thing. And Mount Sinai was a massive rock formation by itself. And Moses brings the children of Israel and everybody's pitching their tents all around and, and Moses is on his way. But before Mo Moses in Exodus 32 went up to that mountain, in Exodus 31, we know 
that the Lord spoke to a man called Bezalel, who was an artist, who was given a God-given, uh, 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 what I call uh, talent, to be able to do several things. One of them, the Bible says, is the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting. Most of the people around the world then, they don't understand that the name, the real name, the original name of the tabernacle in the, in the wilderness wasn't a tabernacle in the wilderness. It's actually a tent of meeting. And I love it because that's the essence of what God wants from us. God wants to meet us. God wants to see us. God wants us to be with Him. The meeting with Him is more important to Him than anything else that we might do as far as sacrifices and rituals and traditions. Just spend time with me. Sometimes we can, we can try to do so many things to God, so many things for God, so many things in the name of God, yet we don't even spend time with God. It's interesting, it can be also the portion of me, many people in the ministry when they try to save the whole world and not even their own. And I feel that also I'm being rebuked many times by the Lord that, you know, you can travel and, and speak, but what about your own? So the, the entire understanding that we need to spend time with Him, we need to meet with the Lord, we need to be with Him, was there in that essence of the tent of meeting. It's interesting because there was special things that the Lord said that the tent of meeting should be made of and look like. But I want you to understand that in chapter 31, we see how the Spirit of the Lord came upon Bezalel, the first artist, and he made all of those things. And then in chapter 32, Moses goes up to the top of Mount Sinai. And while Moses is there, the children of Israel are doing something terrible. So terrible that you would think that after they do it once, after they were punished so severely once, they will never do it again. The children of Israel who were saved and rescued from Egypt and were taken on eagles' wings, basically, all the way to the Red Sea, and the Red Sea parted, and they crossed, and they received everything they needed, whether it's food or water, whether it's protection and guidance in the desert, the pillar of, of cloud at the day, and the pillar of fire at night. The Bible even says that the Lord assigned an angel, an angel to take care of His people, which, by the way, we'll let, take a look at it in a few minutes, we believe it was Jesus, Jesus himself. Just like jo uh, Jacob had another name, Israel. Just like Paul was Saul. Just like Peter was Simon. We can see that even in the scriptures, the angel of the Lord is the one that always did things on behalf of God and was the thing, the messenger, the entity that God sent to lead and guide and take and rescue. And so we clearly see an amazing way of God's protection and provision. And all He wants is one thing from the people. He doesn't need their money. He doesn't need their singing. He doesn't, he doesn't need their dancing. He doesn't need their sacrifices. All He needs is one thing. Just obey. Just be in obedience to that which I'm asking you. I'm asking not much, but the little that I ask, I want you to obey. And throughout the scriptures, every time I search for what is it that God asked from the people of Israel to avoid, not to do, I always got to the point where these are doctor prescriptions. These are military strategies. The God was there to help them to take care of their temples, the body, to help them to take care of themselves family-wise, to take care of their relationship, to take care of themselves from the enemy, to take care of, of the fabric of the society, to take care of themselves spiritually. 
So everything God says to the people of Israel while he gave Moses the law on Mount Sinai was actually instructions for life that would make your life better. And you can have a child and you can tell your child, stay away from this and stay away from that because you know exactly what's going to happen if he's not doing that. And the child might not obey and of course suffer from the consequences. And all that God wants from us is that obedience will be there so we can see the fruit. The fruit of his love, care, provision, the fruit of, of, of God's grace. Now, the other day I was listening to a sermon given by a pastor and he said that the Old Testament is no longer important. In fact, he said, we need to teach only the New Testament because the New Testament is the full counsel of God. And let me tell you something. One of the problems in those type of things is because there is that picture that God of the Old Testament is not full of grace and not full of love. And the God of the New Testament is full of grace and love. Almost as if there are two different gods. Almost as if there are two different um, scriptures. Almost as if it's two different uh, ways and, 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 and movements. And I'm amazed because when we come all the way to Deuteronomy chapter 33, which is the chapter that talks about the tent of meeting for the first time being active, we see that God talks to Moses and he says to him, Moses, you found grace in my sight. You found grace in my sight. How interesting it is. That is the same thing that we can, we can read when it comes to uh, Noah. If you really think about it, we can see in Genesis 6, 8, the Bible says that grace is there already with Noah. How Noah was found, found grace in God. From Genesis, the grace of God was there. The love of God was there. The care of God was there. It's not from, from uh, Matthew. It's from Genesis. And then, of course, we can see in Hebrews 4.16 how we have that throne of grace where we can find grace when we need it. But that throne of grace is of the same God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's not a different God. I've been to the Sistine Chapel. I've seen how Michelangelo described God. Michelangelo described God as a fierce, very angry human face. And you see that people don't know him and you don't know him because you don't have him in you and you don't spend time with him and you don't meet him there is no tent of meeting in your life with the Lord because if you come and see God you know that he's full of grace and full of love full of forgiveness I'm thinking about the prophet Jeremiah writing those words and it is a prophet that saw Israel completely in disobedience. A prophet that saw Israel preparing for a war when they shouldn't have. A, a prophet that saw arrogant and proud and, and boastful nation that thought that they could beat the Babylonians. And by the way, they didn't think that they can beat the Babylonians because God is going to be with them, but because Egypt is going to come to help them. How amazing it is that even in the midst of that, God speaks through Jeremiah and says, I remember our days in the desert, in a land that is not sown, where you relied only on me. I'm looking at the current situation of Israel. I'm looking at a country that is surrounded by Hezbollah in the north, ISIS in the northeast, 
Al-Qaeda on the east, Hamas in the south, and you're thinking to yourself, what is it that brings or gives us the assurance that we can live here in peace, stability, safety, and prosperity? You know, 10 years ago, Israel was lagging behind Greece in the GDP. We're talking about $25,000 per person per year. We're 37,000 already, and Greece is still 24,000. And we're still not where we need to be. And we're in a state of war ever since we were born with so many. Yet God is there to protect, because God has a purpose. And circumstances really means nothing. So Moses goes to the top of Mount Sinai, and the Lord says to Moses, these people down below, they are doing some horrible things right now. You better go down and see what they're doing. The people down below made a golden calf. But the worst thing was not just to make the golden calf. The worst thing was that they said, here are your gods, O Israel, that brought you out of Egypt. And you would think that such a terrible thing to say when you know that the Lord God of Israel did that and he was there for you. But just 40 days, Moses was gone. And that's it. We often give God time. We often try to, to tell him, well, this is what you need to do and that's the time frame you need to do it or else I'm going somewhere else. 40 days. If you really think about it, that was a long time for them. They were used to see God in actions every day. <laughs> and eagle's wings parting the sea, going every day. Every day something happened. Suddenly for 40 days they hear nothing. And, and this is sometimes the hardest thing for us is to wait upon the Lord. And so, guess what are they worshiping? They worship what? The golden calf. And I was thinking, why golden calf? Golden calf or a calf or a bull in those days, something that they actually brought from Egypt. Indeed, it was called Apis or Hapis. That was the name of that animal that was a representative of a deity. In fact, they say that it served as an inter intermediary between humans and all-powerful God. Somehow, they thought we need someone to mediate between us and God. He's gone. He can't hear us. Isn't that so sad that millions around the world today, hundreds of millions around the world today, because they don't know God or because they cannot hear Him, obviously because they don't have His Holy Spirit in them, they're looking for mediators. Whether it's Mary that you pray to in order for her to turn to Jesus, or whether it's a medium <laughs> that you go to in order to tell you what's going up, what's going to happen. That direct connection between man and God was damaged not because of God. It's because of man's lack of patience and lack of obedience. Very simple. And remember, God is in the business of a tent of meeting. God wants to dwell among His people. He wants His people to meet with Him, to spend time with Him. And now we come to our chapter, chapter 33 of the book of Exodus. Then the Lord said to Moses, depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt. Can you feel the separation already? Can you feel that the Lord is not happy? And then he said, 
whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, to your descendants I will give it, and I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite and the Amorites and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivites and the Jebusite, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. Wow. So, first of all, we see something very interesting here. And a lot of people don't pay attention to it. God is saying to the people of Israel, I'm going to send you someone with you. It's not going to be me. The angel of the Lord, who will fight for you, who will take you, who will redeem you, who will bring you and do everything I need you to, to go through, which means he is God. It's not just someone yet it's not the father because the father cannot tolerate such lack of holiness and it's interesting because people are saying well of course if it's not the father how could he have sent the son when they're still not ready well he sent his son also later on when we were not ready the father is holy and through His Son, Jesus Christ, we were given a way and reconciliation to the Father. So watch this. The Lord says to the people of Israel, to Moses, I am going to send you with my angel. But it's interesting because that angel of the Lord appears in so many places in the scriptures places where we see it's what we call it's what we call the um, theophany of of god in the scriptures god will come in the shape of either, either an angel or a person and that is of course jesus jesus was there from the very beginning from the creation of the world he was there he, he testified of, the, of himself before everything was, I was. The Bible says, Mi kedem, mi me olam, from ancient times, before the foundation of the world, he was. That is the son that was given unto us. And his going forth are from everlasting. So he was there when the world was created and he was there when the children of Israel were there and he was there about to lead them into their land and it's interesting because the Lord says to Moses you know I can't go with you <laughs> you are stiff-necked people that's it you know you just don't listen every every time I'm thinking about my nation my people I'm reminded that we are a picture of the whole world. And yes, we were in disobedience. But why is it that God is writing all about us so the whole world is going to read and learn? It's a, what, what I call shaming. <laughs> well, it's because we are a picture of everyone else. And it's because the love of God shown to Israel is the love of God shown to the whole world also. And through them, in spite of what they do, He's going to produce the faith in one God to the whole world. The scriptures, the word of God to the whole world. And the Messiah, the Son of God, to the whole world. It is through them, that stiff-necked people. And all of us can learn from that. God cannot be with us. He cannot dwell with us. He cannot tabernacle with us. He cannot meet us if we're stiff-necked people. Oftentimes, people don't understand why they can't hear God or they don't see God answering prayers. Well, the Bible gives us a list of reasons why God may not answer your prayers. All, in fact, all of them has to do with you. 
not with him. If you are not walking in his ways, you cannot expect him to do his part in this whole thing. And so Moses heard that. And it's interesting, God is not saying, oh, we are so stiff-necked people, I'm going to send you to hell right now. No, he says, I'm going to send you to a land flowing with milk and honey. Why is it? Because God is a God that keeps his promises. And he keeps saying that. It's the land that I swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give it. If I promised, I will fulfill it. So wait a minute, you want to tell me that if God promised me eternal life and, and, and I wasn't a good believer for a certain time and, or I did some wrong things and now I repented, do, do you want to tell me that he will keep his promises? Oh yeah. Oh yes. I want to tell you that God is not looking for perfect people. I want to tell you that God is looking for obedient people. And God is looking for humble people that once they fall, they will stand up and they will repent and they will admit their wrongdoing and they will change their ways. God is, you know, the Bible says that from heavens the Lord looked down to see if any is righteous, if any is doing anything good, and he found none. God has a certain expectation from, from human beings and, and it's adjusted to who they are in a fallen world as sinful people. But all we need is that obedience that I believe can only be achieved when we have the Holy Spirit in us and can only be given to us when we accept Jesus into our very hearts. And the people heard this bad news in verse 4, and they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are stiff-necked people. I could come up into you midst in one moment and consume you. Now therefore take off your ornaments that I may know what to do to you. So the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. God says, take off all of that. You adorn yourself with things. You're celebrating in a world that you, are cre you have created. But in reality, you walk in disobedience. I I'm, I'm looking at the world today. Everybody's celebrating. There's carnivals everywhere. People celebrate. They could care less. Carnivals, by the way, it's all about carne, the flesh. It's all about how they can manifest their, the desires of their flesh. And God is looking at these people. And He's telling the children, take off all your ornaments. And then Moses took his tent, watch this, and he pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp. God says, you know, I, I, I can't be with you. So Moses says, you know what? You can't be with us. I'm going to take my tent and I'm going to go out of the camp and I'm going to pitch my tent far from the camp. And look what happened. And he called it the tabernacle of meeting. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. How sad that God wanted to be amongst us and it's us who drove him out and now we need to go out in order to seek his place and seek his face that distance that being so remote the bible says that we're separated from god because of our sins but that separation was not meant to be God did not and never wanted that separation. If anything, God remembers what? The times we were together in the desert. And now, shortly after these things happen, 
that he took them out on the eagle's wings and he brought them all the way to Mount Sinai. Shortly after, he, he parted the Red Sea and he gave them manna and he gave them water to drink. Shortly after all of that, the separation once again. He's out far from the camp. I'm thinking about it and it's just so sad. And, and the people were sad. And then the Bible says, so it was whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle that all the people rose and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked to Moses. Now we're going to see something very interesting here. Moses goes into a tabernacle that is far from the camp. He walks in, the pillar of cloud comes down, protects everything. Nobody can come in or go out. And Moses is inside, what? Talking to the Lord. Isn't that beautiful that the Lord Jesus, by His shed blood, gave us free access to the throne of grace, to the Holy of Holies, that we may find grace in, in times of need, and we can go and spend time with the Lord. And there's a cloud, the pillar of cloud that is standing there and not allowing anyone to, to interfere or not allowing anything to, to stand in our way. And, and, and it's interesting because watch this. This is something that most people don't understand. There's a, almost an oxymoron here. There's almost like, how can that be? It says here that all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door and all the people rose and worshipped each man at his tent door. And then it says, so the Lord spoke to Moses face to face. Now this is very interesting because we're going to see at the very end of this chapter that that is almost impossible. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Who is our friend? What a friend we have in Jesus. Who spoke to him face to face? As a man speaks to his friend. If we only come before the Lord and meet with him. And Moses was a very tragic figure. If you really think about it, he knows the people he's with. He knows what he's dealing with, who he's dealing with, what he's dealing with. Moses is very depressed. While he was on the mountain, they did a horrible thing. And Moses is not like everybody else. But Moses wasn't perfect either. He had his own portion of disobedience, didn't he? But Moses spoke to God as a man speaks to his friend. And then the Bible says, And he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Look how God already prepared that young man to one day take the mantle of Moses and lead the nation into the land of Israel. He was there. And watch this. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. I love Moses. He's a true Jew. He's standing right there and he's talking to God really, truly like his friend. And he says, Wait a minute. First of all, before God sent him to Pharaoh, Moses is listening to the Lord saying, you should do this and you should do that. And Moses said, eh, by the way, what did you say your name was? <laughs> oh, it's a, a completely Jewish thing to do. But then right here says, okay, you told me to do this and this and this and this. Who do you expect me to go with? I'm sorry, but look at them. Look at me. Now Moses is 80 years old. I wish all of us at 80 will be so efficient. But 80 years old, Moses is asking the real important question. 
Who will you send me with? Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Moses is really like, you tell me you love me, that you found grace in my sight, you call me by my name. All of those things you tell me, and you send me all by myself? And look at this. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. Amen. Show me, if, every, if anyone goes to my Instagram account, that's the verse that I have. I pray that if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. Moses basically said to God, hey, don't forget, you call me your friend, that I found grace in your sight, that I'm a blessed man, that you know me by my name. Well, don't forget, these are also your people. <laughs> so you can't just not show up. The Lord said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. All it took for God to say, okay, is for Moses to say, hey, I'm praying that you will show me your way so I may find grace in your sight. That's all. It's the essence of our lives. If we want the presence of God in our lives, if we want rest, which is, I believe, what most of the world can't find. People are on anxiety pills. People can't find rest. They don't have the presence of the Lord. And all of that, why? Because they simply don't have the humility to come before God, the creator of the universe, and say, I pray that if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. This is the Lord of the Old Testament and Moses knows that he can find grace. Grace is not a magic word that only Jesus gave in the New Testament. Noah found grace. Moses found grace. The people of Israel found grace. We can find grace. The world can find grace if the only simple action will be taken. Pray. Not my will, but thy will be done. So the Lord says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And then Moses said to the Lord, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. Moses said, I'm not moving from this place unless your presence is with me. I'm thinking to myself, what an amazing testimony of a man that says such words to the Lord, the creator of the universe. I'm not moving from this place unless you go with me. You know what? This is the type of chutzpah that God really likes. <laughs> and I, I really think that every one of us shouldn't be so polite when it comes to demanding God's presence and saying, I'm not moving an inch unless you are with me. God loves this. This is the type of people he wants. People that are not moving an inch without Him. People that acknowledge that apart from you, I can do nothing, but I can do all things through Christ, Christ who gives me the strength. 
The acknowledgement that it's not my strength, but it's His. The acknowledgement that I need His presence, that I need to meet Him, that I need to be with Him. I can almost hear the echo of these words in the words of Christ speaking later on, almost 1,500 years later. And it's interesting because Moses is talking to the people of Israel right here. And he, he just said to God, For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. Wow. It's not because we are so good, so smart, so intelligent. It's because God's presence is with us. And we are called to be separated from all the peoples on, that are upon this world. Why? Because that which makes you different is not about you, but it's about your acknowledging that you cannot do anything but through Him. And He says, Lord, I can't move from here. A, because I'm not moving without you. B, the only way I can be separated, me and my nation, the only way that we can be different is if you are with us. And if you want to be different, and if you want to make a difference, and if you want to be used by God, and if you don't want to be conformed but be transformed from this world, the only thing you need is the presence of God in your life. And the only way I know that the presence of God today can come and be part of you is by the Holy Spirit that will only come if you believe in Jesus Christ. There is no way, there is no truth, and there is no life but Him. There is no name under heaven by which men can be healed and saved but Jesus. And Moses knows that. You know why Moses knows that? I believe Moses saw Jesus. I believe Moses talked to Jesus. I believe Moses knows exactly that it's without Jesus he cannot do anything. Why? Because when we read that he spoke to him just like a friend, face to face, the Lord said to him, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me and you shall stand on the rock. Wow. Stand on a rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by, then I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So ladies and gentlemen, God the Father, who was separated from us by our own deeds, who is so holy, who wanted to dwell with us ever since the Garden of Eden. The Bible talked about the fact that God was walking in the garden. Ever since then, God wanted to tabernacle with His people. How do I know Moses spoke to Jesus? It's very simple. No man can see the face of God. And God made it clear in that chapter. Yet, who is it that God had Moses talk to face to face as a man speaks to his friend, if not Jesus himself? And we see the theophany of the Lord Jesus in so many places around along the Old Testament that we shouldn't be surprised. Jesus himself, if he walked them into the land, will he forget about them later? Never. And just as he never forgot about his own people, whom he foreknew, he will never forget about you. 
And just as he so much into fulfilling his promises to people who forgot about him, how much more he will be about fulfilling his promises to you. The only thing you need to do is this, Lord, I pray that I will find grace in your sight and you will show me your way so I can walk in it and find that grace. That's all that God wants from His people. And He wants you to be gutsy and have that chutzpah to say, I'm not moving unless your presence is with me. There's no better music to the ears of God than saying, I can do nothing without you. I can do all things through you. And I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you. So we need God. And we need that tent of meeting every day in our lives. To see him face to face as a man seeing his friend. God bless you.